Europe's economic crisis is having a negative impact on some American companies. I'm Peter Latman, reporting for Business Day Live. We have a report on an energy boom in the Ohio River Valley. But first, one reason the U.S. economy has been described as recovering has been strong corporate profits. But concerns are now growing that weak sales in Europe will dampen that growth. Nate Popper has been looking at some of the American companies most dependent on Europe. He joins me now. Hello, Nate. Hi, Peter. Great story today. So, you know, the conventional wisdom for a long time as Europe was encountering problems was that American companies would be largely immune from those problems, but now it seems that's not the case. This is the famous decoupling of the American economy that people have been talking about for the last two years. I think somewhat hopefully the notion that American companies, you know, there, that there wasn't enough revenue coming from Europe to really uh, create a problem when Europe's economy turns into recession, which is what it looks like it's doing right now. But um, as, as it does turn into recession, it's looking like maybe some of those hopeful notions of the decoupling yeah. uh, were hopeful. I mean, you had this eye-popping stat in the article that said that the block of European Union countries is bigger economically than China and the U.S. Absolutely. I mean, you, this, it's, it's just too large a part of the world economy um, for the U.S. to, you know, remain distant from. And, um, and that's why we, we tried to dive into and look at, um, you know, just how exposed are American companies. And, and, and it's true that, you know, there are industries, there are uh, sectors of the U.S. Yeah, economy. Yeah, so, so you, re you really broke it down, and I found that most fascinating, you said um, certain industries like technology and automakers were perhaps more exposed than, say, consumer products companies where people are always going to buy diapers in Europe no matter what the costs are. Exactly. And what's so striking is that some of the industries that are the most exposed here are also some of the industries that have been the biggest drivers of growth um, in the U.S. economy and the U.S. recovery over the last two years. Right. And I think particularly of technology um, because, you know, the NASDAQ was just roaring earlier this year. Um, but it turns out that something like 30 to 40 percent of profits or 30 to, 30 to 40 percent of revenues in the tech industry come from Europe. And that's, that's in contrast to maybe 15 percent um, for the overall sort of U.S. corporate hmm. scene. Um, so, so that's an enormous exposure to Europe. And, and then we have also, um, we have a weaker, or Europe has meant a stronger dollar, right? And that makes American products more expensive overseas. Sure. sure. There, there are a lot of, you know, sort of channels through which this European situation, I think, is entering into the U.S. economy. Um, I think the, the currency issue is one, and, and that's actually a sort of, a new, pretty new one that we're just starting to hear mm -hmm. about. Companies are just starting to talk about the fact that our products are m are becoming more and more expensive in Europe. Even if nothing changes, just just with uh, the dollar gaining in value against Europe, our, our our products are becoming more expensive. People are going to buy less of them. Um, I think the other big thing that people have have perhaps ignored is the fact that Asia, which has been this engine of growth is incredibly reliant on exports to Europe, much more so than the United hmm. States. And so when exports to, uh, to Europe from Asia start going down, obviously yeah. incomes in Asia start going down, and all of the demand that's there starts to dry And up. we've seen that now, too, recent reports that growth in China and India, which were largely the engines of growth over the past decade, are now slowing. So that's why we've seen market weakness over the past week or so. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's really coming from, from all directions. And, um, yeah, the fact that we saw that weakness in um, Indian, um, uh, Chinese manufacturing sector coming at the same time um, as European manufacturing weakness, U.S. manufacturing weakness, I mean, it's really across the board here. Well, thanks a lot for coming on, Nate. Thanks, Peter. Finally, energy companies are rushing to lease lands where hydraulic fracturing or fracking could release large stores of fuel. That's a windfall for landowners in one corner of Ohio, abandoned long ago by manufacturing. Residents there are pursuing a new strategy to get the best deal and guarantees of environmental safety when selling leases to the oil companies. Brent McDonald and Keith Schneider filed this report. I didn't believe it till I would actually see it, <laughs> so we got to see it today. 
$238,413.20. Kind of unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> More money we've ever seen. The oil and gas boom sweeping across Pennsylvania and West Virginia is starting to show up on doorsteps in southeast Ohio in the form of lottery size lease checks. He needs a tractor. <laughs> He's supposed to order it tonight now that we have the check. <laughs> well, I'm looking for at least a 75 horse tractor. To run. For folks like Tom and Cheryl Tanoose, who own 60 acres of oil and gas rights in Noble County, more money is likely to come, potentially much more. Well, the geologist just that was at one of the meetings uh, I attended explained that even though the lease money does sound like a lot, which it is, that the major money would come in the royalties that you would receive when they sell the oil or gas off of your property. In the distance you can see one oil rig. For the past few years, the Tanooses and their neighbors have watched the drilling boom from across the Ohio River, and they've grown wise to concerns about getting a fair deal and protecting one's land and water. Now they're banding together to bargain with energy companies for more money and better environmental protections. On their side is Jennifer Garrison, a lawyer and former Ohio State representative. I am a big proponent of collectively bargaining all of your minerals together because you'll get a better result. You have more to offer when you all join together. You need to go with your neighbors. You need to do what, what they're doing. We'll all get the same lease. A landowner group in Sardis, Ohio, recently leased 10,000 acres to Eclipse Energy. We went around telling people, you're most likely going to get between four and $5,000 an acre. You're going to get somewhere between 18 and 20 percent royalty, and you're going to sign this deal in the first quarter of the year. This is the one we just signed. But Their lease contract, like the Tanooses, was drafted by Ms. Garrison. It's 24 pages long and includes provisions for both water testing and waste disposal, stipulations that go beyond current state and federal environmental regulations. My job is to represent the landowner and that your lease is the law of your land. So if something would happen to our water, we don't have anything else available. So it's good to know that they'll take care of that. Southeast Ohio is no stranger to oil booms and busts. The state has tens of thousands of operating wells, many of them at least a half century old. What energy companies are after this time is much bigger and lies much deeper, about 6,000 feet beneath the surface in the Utica Shale Formation. They're bringing water in to get ready to frack this well. To get to it, companies use hydraulic fracturing, or fracking, a method that involves pumping a cocktail of water, sand, and chemicals under extreme pressure to break up the shale. Uh, it's going to change the face of this valley forever. It's beautiful. Uh, people who have afforded protections, it'll still be okay. It'll, it'll make some good hunting ground. Hopefully it'll just revitalize the area. That's, that's the biggest hope, is it will bring industry back. That's all for today. Please follow us at nytimes.com for our continuing coverage of these and other stories. I'm Peter Latman reporting for Business Day Live. Thanks for watching.